George Bush doesn't care about black people. 2005, you were accused by a singer of not caring about black people. Um, yeah, look, I, it wasn't just one person. Uh, this was an opportunity for people to use um, the f response to Katrina as a way to label me a racist, and I didn't like it one bit. And I express significant displeasure. Uh, you, you know, you can call me names, which they did. But being labeled a racist is something I just uh, I, I couldn't stomach now. I can't stomach now. It's just really unbelievably unfair. You talk about extensively kind of the personal relationship that you established with President Bush. Uh, you got to see a side of him that you talk about in the book that you wish more people had a chance to see. Yeah, um, I think George W. Bush was a person who people really didn't understand. The, the sad piece is that that Kanye West moment kind of defined that president, and that was not George W. Bush. That was not the George W. Bush that I knew. George W. Bush was a man who was well aware of, of his party. He was well aware of people. The unfortunate thing is, is that at the time, African Americans um, did not particularly care for the Bush administration. And he told me at the very beginning of the administration why. He said, you know, because I'm a Republican, because of my father, because I'm the government of Texas. But George W. Bush has a heart for the community. And I was not surprised at all to see him at Selma. Mm -hmm. That's the George W. Bush that I know. President Bush the man. And what President Clinton said is absolutely true. To know the man is to like the man. Because he's comfortable in his own skin. He knows who he is. He doesn't put on any pretenses. He takes his job seriously, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. He is a good man. Republican conservative white Americans. For the next week, you might be wondering what that big smile on your black co-worker's face really means. Let me be the translator for you so you will know what's really going through a black person's mind. Obama won! I have no doubt that Hillary Clinton is the right person to lead our State Department and to work with me in tackling this ambitious foreign policy. And I am very proud to announce my choice for America's next Secretary of State. A great honor for John me Kerry. to submit the name to the United States Senate of Cohen L. Powell as Secretary of State. <laughs> My oldest son, Rob, was a part of the George Bush campaign for president and later became chief of staff of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and an advisor to Vice President Cheney. On February 8, 2003, we received this hurried call. My son, Jamal, said that, Dad, we're overturned in the car. And the rescue workers came and told us that our son was dead. And the next day, we were just a mess. And then about 10.30 in the morning, I was lying on the bed, and my wife comes into the room with the phone and says, Bob, President Bush is on the phone. He's calling from Air Force One. And it just sort of amazed me. And so I took the phone, and the president said, Bob, how sorry I am that Rob died, my precious friend. And he consoled me for about seven minutes. And he said, I'm getting ready to call Michelle and pray with her. And he called my daughter-in-law, Michelle, and she told me that he read scripture and prayed with her. And she said, well, Mr. President, I'm, I'm just happy that you're you're calling, but I know you have heavy burdens. He said, Michelle, you are the one that we need to be talking about and concentrating on, not me. But if you need me, you know where Laura, know where we are. I was just so moved and uplifted that 
a man of such importance with all of the burdens of the world on his shoulders that he could take the time to console us at this moment. And in the next week, I had two other occasions to be with the president at a small breakfast at the White House. And I was again amazed because as we greeted one another, he kissed me on the cheek and was nearly in tears and I found myself comforting him because he said, oh, I miss Rob so much. He was so much a part of this campaign, so much a part of my life. And um, I'll never forget this man, as long as I live, for what he did to comfort us. I am proud to sign the Voting Rights Act, Reauthorization and Amendments Act of 2006. After the event, there was a, like a march and photographers, and I was all set to march with them. They had, they placed us, they had me in the front line. And then George Bush came out and got in the march, and I left. Yeah. I decided I wasn't marching anywhere with George Bush. Amen. No. The, the Selma movement stands for nonviolence and peace and democracy and fairness and voting rights. And George Bush stands for just the opposite. He stands for violence and war. Obama authorized 283 strikes in Pakistan. That's six times more than Bush. Drone deaths under Obama are four times higher than under Bush. And this chart here puts it into perspective. We see during the Bush years, strikes were minimal, but then you see them skyrocket after Obama was elected. The peak, as you can see, being in 2010. And while it decreased since then, it's still much higher this year than it ever was under Bush. I'm running for president to change course, not to continue George Bush's course. You know, President Bush used this about once every 40 days. Uh, by one recent count, uh, the president uses it once every four days. That's 10 times as much. I think this occasion was not appropriate for him to be, be here. I think for him to appear to be leading people involved in the nonviolent movement in this country, for photographs of that to go across the world would make it look as though we have sold out. My family and I want to present to you a portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. to hang in the White House as an ever-present reminder of the power of the dream. Martin, Bernice, will you unveil the portrait? Some figures in history, renowned in their day, grow smaller with the passing of time. The man from Atlanta, Georgia, only grows larger with the years. America's a better place because he was here, and we will honor his name forever. It is now my honor to sign the proclamation.
while walking onto the House floor to deliver his recent 2012 State of the Union speech. President Obama told U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, great job tonight. But Mr. Obama's actual speech made no mention of sub-Saharan Africa. Kwaku Nwama, a Ghanaian professor at American University in Washington, is not surprised. In Africa is not big in Washington and um, there's no constituency that cares about Africa. Today on the continent of Africa, nearly 30 million people have the AIDS virus including 3 million children under the age 15. There are whole countries in Africa where more than one-third of the adult population carries the infection. More than 4 million require immediate drug treatment. Yet across that continent, only 50,000 AIDS victims, only 50,000, are receiving the medicine they need. Because the AIDS diagnosis is considered a death sentence, Many do not seek treatment. Almost all who do are turned away. A doctor in rural South Africa describes his frustration. He says we have no medicines. Many hospitals tell people, you've got AIDS. We can't help you. Go home and die. In an age of miraculous medicines, no person should have to hear those words. going head to head essentially with President Uhuru Kenyatta talking gay rights issues. The idea that they are going to be treated differently or abused because of who they love is wrong. I mean, what kind of backward, intolerant country would treat people differently just because they're gay? That is so one month ago. <laughs> Similarly, with respect to uh, the rights of, of gays and lesbians, I've been consistent all across Africa on this. For Kenyans today, the issue of gay rights is really an honor. I asked the Congress to commit $15 billion over the next five years, including nearly $10 billion in new money, to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean. We thank sincerely the American people. They are the people who are saving lives. They are the people who can be proud that lives are being saved on this continent. President Bush created the program in 2004 with the bipartisan backing of Congress. Last year, Congress raised the funding for about $7 billion a year for the next five years. You've called this the greatest aid effort in modern times. Absolutely. There has never been a rescue mission, a mission of mercy of this magnitude that has produced such magnanimous results. He told us Africans now see America differently. The impression that people in Africa have of America is that America is no longer the world's policeman. It is now Africa's friend. What an image. And how about this image? All of these exuberant-looking children, every one of them, has HIV or AIDS. They would all be dead or dying if it weren't for America. Now they're alive and thriving. Since making a speech in Ghana in 2009 about how the United States would hold African leaders accountable to good governance, President Obama has not returned to the continent. Patrick Mubobo, a Congolese American recently protesting in front of the White House, is one of those bitterly disappointed with Mr. Obama. After the U.S. government did little following flawed 2011 elections in his native, mineral-rich and heavily U.S.-assisted Democratic Republic of Congo. We want to tell him that uh, it's over if he doesn't do the right thing for Congo, for the children who are crying and dying, uh, if he doesn't do the right thing for democracy. Uh, he, he, he can count that he, lo he not only he lose my vote, but he lose a lot of people. I'll be very votes. brief, and I'll be limiting my comments just to the things that I know personally that have been important for me and for George W. Bush. In uh, 2000, as some of you may remember, there was a disputed election for several weeks. And finally, when uh, President Bush became president, they had the inauguration in Washington on schedule. And I think my wife and I were the only two volunteer Democrats on the platform. And George and Laura afterwards came up and thanked us for coming. 
And so I, he said, now, if there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know, which was a mistake he made. <laughs> I said, Mr. President, the Carter Center has programs in 35 countries in the world, and the worst problem now is a war going on between North and South Sudan. And millions of people have been killed, and I'd like for you to help us have a peace agreement there. And in a weak moment, he said, I'll do it. And I said, when can I meet your Secretary of State and your National Security Advisor? He said, well, I haven't even chosen them yet, but give us three weeks. So three weeks later, I came up and met with Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, and President Bush kept his promise. He appointed a distinguished senator from Missouri, John Danforth, and a great general from Kenya named Sumbewo. And on the first, in January of 2005, there was a peace treaty between North and South Sudan that ended a war that had been gone for 21 years. George W. Bush is responsible for that. And that was the first of his great contributions to the countries in Africa. As has already been mentioned briefly here, he increased the development assistance to Africa from the time he went in office until he left from $1.4 billion to more than $9 billion. And that's an increase of 640%. That is development assistance. He established a PEPFAR program. There were 50,000 HIV sufferers in Africa being treated when he came in office. When he left office per year, 2 million. I'll let you figure the percentage on that. And now at this new institute, he has a program called Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and he says to save women from cervical and breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's, again, is something that's dear to my heart and I know means a lot to millions of people in Africa. So, Mr. President, let me say that I'm filled with admiration for you and deep gratitude for you about the great contributions you've made to the most needy people on Earth. Congress, they will cut AIDS funding right here in the United States of America and all across the world. To America, to America, to America, to America, and all across the world. You know, one of the great things about being a Democrat is we, we, we like arguing with each other. But I would suggest to the folks who are concerned about AIDS funding, take a look at what the Republican leadership has to say about AIDS funding. Which president has done more than any other to fight AIDS? What president has done more than any other to combat AIDS? George, George Bush. Bush. You would call him, uh, I think, the worst thing that had ever happened to America? Or some, yeah, some, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of his policies, nor was I of Tony Blair's in England. I, I was very against the Iraq war. So I, I, it kind of, you know, I, it didn't, his policies didn't sit well with mine. But, but you, you got a chance to meet him uh, at the Kennedy Center Honors? At the Kennedy Center uh, uh, concert, uh, we spent some time in the intermission with the President, George Bush, and he was amazingly informed about AIDS. He treated us with such kindness. I had so much respect for him, um, especially when the PEPFAR thing was announced that he gave $15 billion to AIDS. He yeah. knew what he was talking about. One of the old adages in life says, never judge someone until you meet them. And um, I didn't like his policies, but I have to say when I met him, I found him charming, I found him well informed, and I found him determined to do something about the AIDS situation. So I changed my opinion of him. And, uh, and his wife was astonishingly kind to us as well. So it was, um, I learned a lesson. Do you need to see President Obama do more? Obama's doing a great job. So tell me a little bit about what impact PEPFAR has made in Uganda since the program um, was first created in 2003. Well, PEPFAR saved millions of lives in Africa. And in Uganda, uh, we got uh, 170,000 people who would not have lived. But I would suggest to the folks who are concerned about AIDS funding, take a look at what the Republican leadership has to say about AIDS funding. You've been expressing concerns recently about flat funding in PEPFAR's budget. Can you tell me what you're seeing on the ground in Uganda in your clinic? Well, uh, flat funding has begun to reverse these wonderful achievements of PEPFAR. We have begun to see uh, patients 
being turned, turned away from clinics. So what, what are you, what will happen if flat funding continues, if this becomes the new reality? We are going to have people beginning to die in a very big number. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Katrina must not fade to a whistle. Those words have been bought in a tangle of half measures, half hearted leadership, and red tape. After Hurricane Katrina, and I don't want to compare this to Katrina, but it took two days for President Bush to uh, lift the Jones Act to be able to let, you know, foreign boats come into the water to be able to help out two days. I just don't like going to the space here. And we're going to continue to update the American people on the situation in the Gulf, in the Gulf going forward. The president also said Kenya and other African nations still cling to traditions that marginalize women and discourage them from working. That's stupid. <laughs> You're idiots. <laughs> knock, knock, who's there? You don't know, you're stupid. <laughs> Obama arrived in Saudi Arabia today. I thought it was very important uh, to come to uh, the place where Islam began uh, and to seek uh, His Majesty's Council. They did not discuss global concerns about Saudi human rights abuses. Oh, well, let that be a lesson, Africa. You want to people, you need to lube us up first. <laughs> <laughs>